Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this OncLive Peer Exchange Panel discussion on the use of immunotherapy in advanced lymphoid malignancies. Since the approval of rituximab in 1997, we've known the success of using immunotherapy to treat lymphoid malignancies. As evidenced by the adoptive immunotherapy realized through graft-versus tumor responses following allogeneic stem cell transplantation, which has cured a potential for nearly all hematologic malignancies, we know this area offers particularly fertile ground for immune-targeted strategies. Now, with several novel strategies emerging that harness the ability of T lymphocytes to target cancer cells, it's imperative that hematologists and oncologists understand how these new therapies work and how to use them. In this OncLive peer exchange, I'll be joined by a panel of experts to discuss how the newest immunotherapies will be integrated into modern care of patients with advanced lymphoid malignancies. I'm Dr. Ian Flynn. I'm the director of the Sarah Kennan Center for Blood Cancer in Nashville, Tennessee. Joining me today are Dr. Krishna Kamandori, Professor of Medicine and Director of the Adult Stem Cell Transplant Program at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of Miami. Dr. Andre Gua, the Chairman and Executive Director of the John Thor Cancer Center at Hackensack University Medical Center, located in Hackensack, New, Jer New Jersey. And Dr. Frederick Locke, Assistant Member and Director of the Immune Cellular Therapy and Research Program at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. We know there's been tremendous success of the checkpoint inhibitors in the treatment of solid tumors. It seems that in the hematologic malignancies, we're a little bit um, behind there, but there is some data that's been emerging about the use of these drugs um, in that arena. Andre, what's, what's going on there? You're right. I mean, we have um, <clears throat> heard a lot of the um, last years and at this high school, particularly across the board in immunotherapy and checkpoint inhibitors, remarkably across a number of solid tumors, but we also have studied some work and seen some data in hematological malignancies. So about over two years ago, we had the first data of checkpoint inhibitors, nivolumab, across the board at a phase one study showing, acti showing activity of about 30, 40 percent in a number of different subtypes of uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. About at the same time, there was a study in Hodgkin lymphoma in patients heavily pretreated, most had received prior hydrostepy and transplant, and three quarters of them had received prior brantuximab. And the response rate to nivolumab, which is given at three milligrams per kilo every two weeks, was actually very impressive with 85% and 20%, um, and almost 20% CR. These response rates were actually uh, updated recently and very durable, some of them up to two years. At the same time, there's, as you mentioned, there's a number of other checkpoint inhibitors. So we have a pembrolizumab study in patients who have a heart relapse refractory Hodgkin lymphoma who had to have, a, by definition, they had to have failed prior brentuximab. And similarly, the response rate was 50-60% have CR and very durable. In all, all of these studies, we see the same toxicity profile that we see with um, checkpoint inhibitors in solid tumors with a lot of uh, inflammatory sort of autoimmune type reaction that are usually manageable. And what's really exciting, it offers us a new platform to develop more in heme malignancies in a number of combinations that are actually ongoing. Great. You know, Krishna, the, these are um, malignancies of the immune system, right? They're, the, they're malignant lymphocytes, yet there's also normal lymphocytes um, sometimes intertwined in the, in the lymph node. Can you walk us through how or, or, or speak to the biology here about how, these, how we might harness these cells? Sure. So I think uh, the key work, uh, the, the original uh, studies uh, in, uh, came really from work in 1970 that suggested that lymphocytes really needed two signals to get activated. The first one came through the T cell receptor, which recognizes the antigen, and the second one came through a co-stimulatory receptor. And, and initially, this was defined, but we didn't know what those second signals were. We later realized that there was a, a molecule called CD28 that was necessary for driving that, that signal number two through T cells that helped them to get activated in addition to signal number one. And then we realized, uh, really over time, and the work of Jim Allison and, and others, and actually uh, Carl June and Paul Martin, at, uh, when, uh, when Carl was at the Hutch, uh, demonstrated that there were both multiple positive and negative signals that were present on, on, on the surface of T cells. So what we have learned, and what really has been applied in clinical practice, first through uh, the work that led to the FDA approval of ipilimumab in melanoma in 2011, was that, for example, CTLA-4, which is a, a, a negative uh, second, stimu uh, sec second uh, signal receptor on the surface of T cells, that an antibody directed against that could basically take the breaks off of T cells. So in the context of ipilimumab, a T cell gets activated, uh, and then the secondary uh, negative signal through CTLA-4 uh, gets amplified unless that signal is blocked. 
when that signal is blocked, effectively the brakes are taken off the immune response and the T cell can get activated in a greater way. So the first FDA approval was really for, uh, again, ipilimumab and antibody against CTLA-4. Uh, and then we saw following that uh, antibodies that regulated the interaction between a second receptor called PD-1 on the surface of T cells, uh, which binds to two ligands called PD-L1 uh, or PD uh, ligand 1 and PD L2. Uh, and we know that uh, through the work of others who are looking at the tumor microenvironment, that, that these ligands for these negative receptors on T cells can actually be upregulated. So, work in Hodgkin's disease suggested that there were actually uh, potential for genetic uh, overexpression uh, and higher regulation of PD L1, which could then provide that negative response that could prevent tumors in the T cell microenvironment from recognizing. Um, you know, the cancer. So uh, first we saw approval again of ipilimumab and melanoma, and then we saw the approval of, uh, again, pembrolizumab uh, in uh, uh, melanoma and lung cancer. Uh, and uh, in 2015, we saw five approvals of single and combination therapies, and really the, the field is, is now exploding, as we saw here uh, uh, this year at ASCO. So the, the data that, um, that Andre just talked about, for example, in, in, in Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma was very exciting.